Dear Prudence is one of the most beautiful songs in the entire Beatles canon. Dear Prudence. Within the song's many captivating layers, however, is an odd anomaly that has been a source of dispute for decades among Beatle fans. In this episode, I'm going to explore that anomaly and explain why the song's special quality may be due to what's missing. As a fair warning, once I point it out, you can't unhear this. Dear Prudence appears as the second song on the Beatles' self-titled 1968 masterpiece, known as the White Album. Composed by John Lennon during the band's 1968 visit to India, the song was written for a very specific Prudence, Mia Farrow's sister, who had joined the group on their spiritual excursion, but had, in John's view at least, become a bit too entranced by meditation. And so he composed a musical plea for her to come out and play. Although written during the India trip, the song was first recorded on a set of tapes known as the Isher Demos, named after the location of George Harrison's estate, where the group had convened in May 1968 to collect some of their new song ideas following the India trip. This acoustic demo, much like the final song, centers around a finger-picking style that John picked up from fellow musician Donovan, another guest on the infamous India jaunt. The version we know today, however, was recorded three months later in August 1968 during the official sessions for what would become the White Album. But there's a couple of anomalies that make this recording rather special. Firstly, it wasn't recorded at EMI Studios, the usual home where the Beatles had developed and recorded the vast majority of their songs. Instead, the group moved over to Trident Studios, a spot in Soho where the Beatles had recently recorded their landmark single, Hey Jude. Trident offered one main alluring advantage over EMI, a then state-of-the-art eight-track recorder, which would allow the group to more easily add layers such as instruments, vocals, or sound effects. EMI Studios, meanwhile, was still using four-track equipment, practically the same setup the band had worked with for almost five years. Not coincidentally, an eight-track recorder would very soon appear at EMI, thanks to, of course, the insistence of the Beatles. In addition to being in a different venue, the other major anomaly that week was that the Beatles weren't the Fab Four, but only the Fab Three. On August 22nd, during a recording session for Back in the USSR, Ringo Starr stormed out of EMI Studios, allegedly after receiving one too many instructions from Paul about how he wanted a drum part to be played. The incident wasn't isolated. It was the breaking point following an increasingly tense and disjointed atmosphere during recent sessions. Frustrated and exhausted, Ringo fled to the Mediterranean with his family for some much needed rest and recuperation. Meanwhile, the other three Beatles simply continued on without him, with Paul stepping in on drums during the remainder of the sessions for Back in the USSR. They finished the song the next day, Ringo still absent. Almost a week later, on August 28th, with no sign of Ringo's return, John, Paul, and George reassembled, this time at Trident Studios, to continue working on material for the new album. The trio spent three days laboring over John's new track, Dear Prudence. On the 28th, they recorded a suitable backing track led by John's finger-picked guitar. George Harrison contributed a second guitar, and, in Ringo's absence, Paul added some drums, just as he had done a week earlier on Back in the USSR. The next day, August 29th, the group gathered again to overdub a plethora of new parts, including John's haunting double-tracked lead vocal. The sun is up, the sky is blue, it's beautiful, and so are you, dear Prudence. The mesmerizing harmony vocals. Round, 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 round. some Indian-inspired flourishes on electric guitar, and Paul's treble-cranked bass guitar, which was the focal point of an illuminating segment in the McCartney 321 miniseries. Uh, you know, we use a pick, and you get that very treble end. Making full use of their 8-track setup at Trident, they continued to add in even more parts, such as tambourine 
and hand claps, contributed by Beatle Rhody Mal Evans, Paul's cousin John McCartney, and Apple recording artist Jackie Lomax. Left out of the final version was a very well deserved round of applause. There's even a funny quirk hidden within the isolated bass track. Finally, on Friday, August 30th, they finished off the song in a final evening session at Trident, with some last minute touches from Paul on piano. And perhaps most oddly, a flugelhorn. With that, the densely layered recording of Dear Prudence was complete. After the weekend, the band would meet again, this time back at their home EMI, to move on to a new song. One, two, three, four. While My Guitar Gently Weeps, which marked the official return of Ringo Starr back into the Beatles. Or was it? Let's listen very carefully to the drum part on Dear Prudence. You'll notice that there are two very distinct sections. From the beginning of the song until around the two minute 45 second mark, the drum part is fairly straightforward. Then, at around 2 minutes 45 seconds, it suddenly takes on an entirely different quality in a psychedelic explosion of wild fills, triplets, and more. Here's where it gets really interesting. Listen to the isolated vocal track you can hear that there was originally a different, simpler drum part in this latter section, likely recorded during the backing track and spilling over here into the other microphones. Oh, won't you come out to play? Dear Prudence, I greet the brand new day. Because the drums in the final version of this section are different, we can safely assume that they were added later on. Even more interestingly, the sound of the drum kit changes halfway through this latter section. Listen to the isolated drum track. Pay attention in particular to the snare drum. This switch seems to indicate that not only was this latter part overdubbed, it may have been recorded in multiple segments and stitched together. And here's where the debate comes in. Some fans argue that this wilder, overdubbed part is in fact played by Ringo, not by Paul. The proponents of the Ringo theory claim that this end section wasn't something that Paul could have played. They point to other examples in the Beatle catalog that bear a striking resemblance to Ringo's style, such as the end section of Strawberry Fields Forever, or the fills on Rain, or Blue Jay Way. There are different explanations proposed for how and why this might have happened. Some suggest that Ringo had already come back from his Mediterranean excursion by the end of the Trident sessions, dropping by surreptitiously to add some of his own flair to the track. Others claim that Ringo's part could have been added at some other point before the track was mixed at EMI Studios a few weeks later on October 13th. This debate among fans is not new either. I found conversations online as far back as the late 90s discussing this. The theory appears again and again on Beatle message boards, Reddit posts, and YouTube comments. In 2018, Dear Prudence was remixed for the White Album Deluxe Edition by Giles Martin. Also included on the box set was a new stripped-down mix that featured only the drum track and John's vocals and rhythm guitar. It's neat to hear this simplified version, but because it's only a remix of the existing tracks, it doesn't definitively give us an answer either way as to who's playing the drums. Ultimately, the various explanations for the Ringo theory simply don't have any evidence to support them. If Ringo had shown up at the Trident sessions after his Greek vacation, there probably would be some record of this momentous return, either in recollections or documentation. 
And there's no evidence that the 8-track tape received any further instrumental overdubs after it left Trident. As for the claim that Paul wasn't capable of playing this part, that premise is easily challenged, too, with some clear counterexamples. In addition to his drum contributions on Back in the USSR, Martha My Dear, and the Ballad of John and Yoko, Paul also has a long and respectable list of drum credits following his Beatle days, including on his first solo album, McCartney, and throughout the Wings album, Band on the Run. Other musicians have even invited him to play on their own songs, such as on Steve Miller's My Dark Hour, and more recently on the Foo Fighters' Sunday Rain. So Paul certainly could have pulled this off in 1968, especially using Trident's 8-track recorder to help add and substitute parts. If you thought Dear Prudence featured Ringo on drums, you're certainly not alone. I also used to assume this was the case. After all, it has all the hallmarks of Ringo's style, which no doubt served as an inspiration for Paul's approach here. Funnily enough, even the Beatles' rock band shows Ringo on the drum set. What do you think? Is this Paul, or is it really Ringo? Let me know in the comments. As with many of these debates, the truth isn't nearly as interesting to me as the debate itself. Despite having individual talents and personalities, they were able to emulate each other's styles and create a cohesive sound. Thanks to this, Dear Prudence still has an unquestionably Beatle vibe, even if it doesn't feature all four Beatles. As for the song itself, there is some ineffable quality about Dear Prudence that has hooked me ever since I first heard it. Everything in the song simply works, as it slowly builds from a gentle, delicate lullaby, adding layers along the way until that transcendent climax, all in less than four minutes. I even love its ironic placement on the White Album, coming right off the rocking, tongue-in-cheek opener back in the USSR dropping us from 30,000 feet into this incredibly different tone and mood. If the White Album was about subverting expectations, it's hard to imagine a more fitting two-song sequence to have kicked it off, or to have wrapped it up with the two last songs on the album, Revolution 9 and Good Night, also curiously missing Ringo's drumming. Maybe a nod to his brief absence during the sessions, or just a funny coincidence. Even on its own, Dear Prudence is a widely beloved masterpiece, regularly covered by other artists, and often ranked high on Beatle fan lists. And even though it wasn't a hit single or a song that regularly gets earplay, it holds a very special place in the hearts of many Beatles fans, this one included. As always, please subscribe if you haven't already, and thanks for listening.